Okay, so um, once again, I have to apologize that I don't have the best photos selected yet, but I promise I will get them next time. And at that point, we'll do two weeks at once. Um, or I'll, I'll space it out somehow. Um, okay, uh, remember if you're using the Dory today, uh, today is uh, April 20th, so just look for the um, uh, appropriate entry in the Dory. Um, and uh, a couple of notes on the schedule. So uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, Jesse and Florian's lecture on Monday. I looked at it uh, and it was great. Um, daunting, in fact. Uh, so next week, we only have one lecture, which is Monday. Uh, we couldn't get the room on Wednesday, and so I rearranged the schedule. So next week, only Monday. We'll do history, and then I will give another sidebar lecture on sports photography and computational photography. And then on the, the following week, we'll start in on color. And um, I warmly recommend the color lectures. They are uh, among my favorite lectures and one of my favorite topics and something that Google needs to get a little bit better at. Uh, and so uh, we'll do color theory and then color applications uh, the following week. Okay. So let's continue where we left off. And that was uh, this slide. And we were talking about noise models. And we had gone through what the sources of noise were. And then I put up this formula, which is not the only formula you could find about noise, but it is one that brings together most of the major factors. And we talked about the fact that it's going to be uh, photon shot noise is going to be the number of photons over its square root. And then here was the contribution by dark current, which leaks in over time. And then here's the contribution by read noise. And I said that this signal to noise ratio is going to depend on the number, uh, on the brightness of the scene, um, which is fairly obvious because it's got the number of photons in there. Uh, I'll show you some examples in a moment. Uh, then it's also going to depend on the aperture and the exposure time as well, because that will affect the number of photons. We'll talk about the effect of ISO a little bit later. Okay, so let me give you a few examples. Uh, so I showed these two cameras before. This is the Ratiga cooled scientific camera, and there's this old Nokia N95 cell phone with uh, a fairly decent sensor, actually. All right, so let's suppose that we have 1,000 photons per pixel per second arriving uh, and a one-second exposure. On the scientific camera, uh, let's say the Q, uh, the, the um, quantum efficiency is 55%, and so here's working through that formula. It's got uh, a very low dark current, especially if it's cooled, um, but not such a great read noise. Uh, it's a large pixel. Large pixels tend to have not so great read noises. So here is the signal to noise ratio for this brightness level. Um, and the uh, Nokia has 1 11th the size pixels uh, in area. And so it's that over the square root of that. It's got um, a much worse dark current. Uh, leaking into the pixels per unit time. Um, and actually, it has a better read noise. Smaller pixels do tend to have better read noises just because of the way the circuitry works. So that's got um, a signal to noise ratio of 6 to 1, which isn't as good. Okay, fine. Um, but look what happens if the number of pixels per, pix uh, per second is much, the n sorry, the number of photons per pixel per second is much lower. In other words, it's, let's assume the scene is much darker. Um, and we take a much longer exposure in order to make up for that, then the Ratiga is still going to do pretty well because that dark current is very low. But the Aptina is going to do horribly because the dark current will just completely overwhelm what is being recorded, and you'll lose your signal-to-noise ratio. So don't use your cell phone for astrophotography, uh, except for the averaging that I showed you in Sea in the Dark when we, uh, in the Sea in the Dark app, um, when I talked about extreme imaging. Uh, okay, so I think I've uh, hopefully impressed on you the fact that the signal-to-noise ratio does depend on the signal level, meaning on the brightness of the scene. So a reasonable question to ask is, well, how bright a scene and how dark a scene can you capture? And that's a separate notion from signal-to-noise ratio. It's called dynamic range. And the typical definition of it is this, the maximum output swing over the noise in the dark. So what I mean by that is, at what level does the pixel become saturated, meaning the well fills up with electrons, minus the dark current, um, because some of that is stuff that will leak into the pixel, didn't come from the outside world, 
um, over the square root of, of that much. Okay? So let's look at what that is. So for the Retiga, that's the scientific camera, um, its full well capacity is 40,000 electrons. So each pixel can hold 40,000 electrons before it's just white. Um, and so let's, uh, it's got this uh, very low dark current, and so it might be about 11.7 .7 bits, 3,000 to 1. Uh, the Aptina is not such a large full well capacity, so it's a little bit less, about 10.5 bits. Uh, uh, 10 .5 bits. It's not that bad, though. Cell phones don't have such bad dynamic ranges. The problem is that their signal-to-noise ratio at those various brightness levels is poor because their pixels are small, and so their photon shot noise is high. But their dynamic range is, is not that bad. So what does this dynamic range m imply? Well, it means that uh, it's the precision that's required in the analog-to-digital converter. Um, and therefore, the useful number of bits you'll get out in the raw image. And as I explained when I drew the, the curve from raw to JPEG, which is that gamma curve, that you really need at least 10 bits if you expect to get 8 bits after this gamma correction without contouring artifacts. And indeed, cell phones do have at least 10 bits. The Nexus 6P has uh, more than 10 bits of useful dynamic range. Um, and we take advantage of that by returning a raw image. Uh, okay, so let's show some examples on dynamic range. So there's the formula again, and there is this amazing scientific camera that we use in our laboratory at Stanford uh, that has its uh, back illuminated with an extremely large well and extremely small dark current. And so um, with a little bit of read noise. And so it does 13.7 bits. So it's really very good. And that's if it's cooled. And it has to be cooled a lot, minus 75 Celsius. But you can do even better. Uh, there's this electron multiplication mode that effectively makes the dark current uh, even lower. So, um, sorry, makes the read noise um, almost disappear because it's multiplying the electrons before it reads them out. And so the dark current's already low, the read noise is now insanely low, and so you have 80,000 to 1, essentially, which is 16 bits. If you look at that, you'll say, well, that means it could detect a single photon. Oh, well, yes, this camera can detect a single photon reliably. Uh, as the, my biologist friends like to say, I can see a black cat in a coal mine. Uh, so compare that to the 10.5 bits for the Aptina. So lesson, if you're doing uh, fluorescence microscopy, don't use your cell phone. <laughs> use a camera like this. Okay, so you, you see the difference between signal-to-noise ratio and dynamic range. Dynamic range can be high or low, and then we can separately talk about for each um, brightness level within the dynamic range, what is the signal-to-noise ratio. Okay. So let's now add ISO into the mix. So ISO is a signal gain. Uh, it's linear with light. Uh, we talked about that in the first lecture. So uh, if you double the ISO, it's like twice the exposure time, or minus one f-stop. And it's implemented uh, as analog amplification before the, uh, digital, uh, the analog to digital conversion. But I have to put a big caveat on that. So if we have the sensor here, and it's got pixels on it, and it's reading off one of these pixels, it will first send it through this analog amplification. And so the voltage that comes out will be higher. Then it goes through the analog to digital converter that we talked about last time, which converts it into numbers. And those numbers can go through a further multiplication, but at this point it's just a digital multiplication. And that's what goes into the raw file. This kind of gain is useful. This kind is not. You might as well do this in Photoshop. And so the question then for any camera is, what is its analog ISO maximum? 
And any ISO below, above that is just multiplying the numbers. So uh, they don't publish this. Various people have tried to figure it, it out by looking at noise <coughs> levels. And so for the Canon 5D Mark II, it's about ISO 6400 is the limit of the analog gain. Above that, it's just multiplying numbers. I think it might be slightly higher for the uh, 5D Mark III. Okay, so in general, if you were designing such a system, you'd like to amplify as early as possible. You would certainly, uh, you'd like to amplify before noise is added, and noise is added at a variety of places in the pipeline. And most importantly, you would definitely like to multiply the voltage before the analog to digital converter. Because if you didn't, then if you have taken a low voltage and run it through this analog to digital converter, you might end up with like a number from zero to seven coming out of it. Multiply that later and you're going to have contouring. So you really want to multiply that voltage before it gets quantized. Okay. Uh, right, so I said that. You especially want to amplify it before quantization. In fact, if you quantize a very low signal, you might get zero, just black. So you definitely want to uh, do that before the analog to digital converter. So um, raising the exposure, typically, if you work through the noise formula, will improve the uh, signal-to-noise ratio faster than raising the ISO just because of the, nation, the nature of photon shot noise versus this contribution to read noise. And so here is a recipe for how to use these quantities. First, choose your exposure according to, uh, sorry, choose your aperture according to the depth of field that you want. And then once you've set that, maximize your exposure time until you're stopped by either the object is moving too fast until you get motion blur, or you shake too much, and we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes when we talk about stabilization. And that produces blur in the image. Or the pixels saturate. If you're stopped by saturation, well, you're done. That's it. But if you're not, if you're stopped by one of the other criteria, like the handshake or object motion, and you would like, uh, you don't want a dark image, then you should raise the ISO until you're stopped by saturation. So that, that's the recipe. You start with the aperture according to the depth of field you want. You then raise your exposure time as high as possible. And then if it's still producing a dark image, then you raise your ISO. Got that? Um, okay. So let's see what's been happening with ISO over the years. Um, Signal-to-noise ratio has been improving with better pixel designs, better processes on making sensors. But the number of megapixels has been rising too. And so they, and pe people are making pixels smaller. And the smaller you make your pixels, the worse your photon shot noise. And so the two have been more or less canceling each other out. In fact, they've been worse than canceling each other out. And so SNR has been slowly dropping over the years. This, uh, this graph is kind of old. It uh, stops at 2008, but the trend has continued, I believe. But it's, what's that? These are, these are uh, years That's from, the two, one, uh, yes, it says signal to noise ratio at ISO 200. Thank you. Mm. Um, by the way, remember that uh, after the lecture is over, I put my slides online as a PDF in addition to the video. And I often put stickies uh, with points that have been brought up during the lecture or in the, uh, in the dory. Um, so uh, you might uh, find it useful to look at that. Question in the back. Some manufacturers have been making low megapixel cameras in order to improve signal to noise. Does that actually make sense? Like yeah. So uh, the, the question is uh, some manufacturers have been making lower megapixel cameras in order to increase signal to noise. That is exactly right. The lemmings have pulled back from the edge of the cliff. Um, now, there may be other reasons in some cases that they are lowering their megapixel count. Um, my guess is that Samsung has been lowering the megapixel count on its uh, um, Samsung Galaxy uh, S6-7 because they wanted to do PDAF, which are these split pixels that give you phase-based focusing and get reasonable signal-to-noise ratio on the depth map. Um, so there might be other reasons. Um, 
uh, some of them might be splitting their lines. Yeah. Um, so, but what's interesting about this is that display resolutions have not risen as fast as the number of megapixels on the camera. And so as a result, we're increasingly downsizing our images for display. And if we average four pixels down to one pixel, then that averages out, that reduces noise as well. And it goes just the same way that it does for the formulas that I've given you. Uh, four to one, um, the SNR, the signal to noise ratio doubles. It goes as the square root. Uh, just as if you had averaged four pixels when you first came out of the image or you had a pixel uh, four times as large or an exposure that was longer. So if you include that effect, then the signal to noise ratio has been getting better. And that, uh, and uh, so the effect of downsizing, of course, is fairly obvious. You take an image like this, um, it's indoors, I've got a very short exposure because I'm trying to freeze the action so you can see that there is noise. If I downsize it just by point sampling, just grab every uh, fourth or tenth pixel in X and Y, then I haven't improved the signal to noise at all. And so that downsized image is also noisy. But if I instead average, it, average the pixels, then that greatly reduces noise. And so downsizing the images using a good filter um, actually helps. And I imagine this was probably uh, Photoshop, some kind of bicubic with a, a, a pre-filter before the second sampling. And that does really reduce noise. So if we include that effect, then it is really useful that we have higher ISOs um, it gives us the ability to use higher ISOs without too much noise. And so here are some examples of that. Uh, a picture taken by Michael Cass at ISO 3200. Looks great. I don't see any noise at all. Of course, I'm down sampled for display, even more so on this uh, 600 by 800 display. Uh, ISO 6400. And here's ISO 25,000. So at this point, there's some digital gain. It's not just all analog gain, as I said before. Um, and Fredo Durand uh, at MIT has also done a little bit of uh, denoising in Lightroom as well. So he said that it was uh, too dark to read the menu in this restaurant. So um, here's the noise. There's the original. See the difference? So that's the Lightroom denoising. So if he said it was too dark to read the menu, it probably actually didn't look like this to him. It probably looked maybe more like that. So how I got from one to the other is an interesting question to try to simulate what it seems to a person in the dark. We will talk about that in a later lecture when we talk about tone mapping. It's a very interesting and deep topic. Uh, okay, so uh, another way um, that you can get better signal to noise ratio is by averaging frames. So I've talked about that already. Here's another example from uh, my own app where uh, she's in a room with uh, just a little bit of light coming in through a window pane. The lights are off, the door is closed, and if I average 30 frames, I'll get something like that. So um, let me show you a more extreme example of that. So I'm jumping ahead of myself a bit in the class to talk about lux levels. Um, lux is a measure of light per unit area, uh, 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 light falling on a surface per unit area of that surface. Uh, we'll define that more precisely later in the course. So here are some typical lux levels. Architects would use these. Um, I wouldn't try to find socks in my drawer that matched unless I had at least 10 lux. Wait, no, I'm okay today. Uh, three lux outdoor lighting. One lux is the limit at which most people can read. The full moon is less than that. I cannot read in full moonlight, although I can come close. Or I can if the text is large, but I can't read a novel. Uh, can't find my keys unless there's a fifth of a lux and a tenth of a lux. I wouldn't even take a step without a flashlight for fear of tripping over something. So uh, at a tenth of a lux, here's what a Nexus 6P can do, a single shot. Uh, it's very noisy. It's a drill press in case you can't see it. So that's a tenth of a lux, but if I accumulate for five seconds, and so this is my app where it's handheld, aligned, and average. Uh, I can get a picture. It's not a beautiful picture. It won't win any Pulitzers, but I can see what's there. So now that we have the noise formula, it's fun to look at this. So uh, one shot, 
at ISO 5400. So this is on the Nexus 6P. And I won't um, bore you with all these details about how I did this computation, but there's a variance from which we <laughs> the square root of that is the uh, standard deviation. The way the formula works is you should add these variances and then take the square root. And so that produces 42 relative to the signal of 100, and that's a signal-to-noise ratio of 2.5 to 1. Uh, I'm doing nothing more than applying the formula that I just gave you. Yeah? Are you calculating these on the raw mode? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm read, uh, th they are done in raw mode. I am reading raw frames from the uh, Nexus 6P using the Camera 2 API. Uh, if I take 10 shots, then the signal goes up by a factor of 10. The variance um, goes up as well. Add those two together, take the square root again. Now this ratio is 7.5 to 1. So there is the advantage of aligning and averaging multiple frames. But uh, yes? So clearly there's some noise related to aligning and averaging frames, you know, like misalignment noise. Is that like irrelevant or very small? Um, misalignment noise. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I never tried to characterize that as noise. I probably should. If I were to write an academic paper about this, I'd better be careful of that. Thank you. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a hard one to characterize. <laughs> but yes, there should be some noise introduced by the alignment procedure as well. It probably is more a loss of resolution would be the better way to characterize that, but uh, I'd have to, you know, rather than a noise. The big, the big issue with it is that noise like this is random, and the eye will, yeah, it, it right. has an effect, but it, Alignment, misalignments tend to be artifacts. They tend to introduce signal that you misperceive. Right. Zalman's saying that it, a noise like this is random, whereas alignment is uh, more structured. That's why I say it may be hard to align uh, to um, characterize. Okay. Now let's say that's at a tenth of a lux. Suppose it were uh, a hundredth of a lux instead, which is extremely dark. Uh, mice would trip without a flashlight in a hundredth of a lux. Um, so the signal is much lower. Do that again, and I'm um, getting a signal-to-noise ratio of less than one-to-one one now. Even if I average 10 shots, that's only barely one-to-one. One. In uh, the research lecture that I give about to this, I say this is why it's hard to autofocus, because I don't even have enough signal to autofocus the camera. But uh, it seemed appropriate at this point in the, in the lecture. Okay, so to recap, signal-to-noise ratio is a measure of the mean over the standard deviation. Uh, rises with the brightness of the scene, but it depends on dark current and read noise. It's poor for very short exposures because the photon shot noise kills you. It's also poor for long exposures because the dark current kills you, except on very specialized cameras that are cooled and have very low dark current. And so there's a sweet spot in the middle of exposure times you should use for particular cameras. Dynamic range is different. It's the maximum swing over the noise in the dark. It has to do with the full well capacity. It says nothing about how noisy those images will be at each signal level. But it does determine the number of useful bits. And then the ISO is the amplification of signal. What's most important is amplification before the analog to digital converter. Okay, any burning questions? Because this is all we're gonna say about noise. Yeah, question. Sorry? The Were there units? Are there units on the signal to noise? No, it's a, ratio, it's a ratio, if that's what you're asking. That's actually one of the reasons we use standard deviation instead of variance, because variance would have units. So this is a unitless ratio. Good question. Yes? What's the point of doing the digital uh, amplification in the, in the diagram? <laughs> What's the point of digital amplification? <laughs> Marketing? <laughs> So uh, Zalman's saying there's software reasons. I guess one reason would be that uh, it would reduce compression artifacts to some extent by making those numbers bigger, maybe. And it's also a normalization step. Like yeah, it's a normalization. Inside the camera to take care of something. Right. 
an out of camera image that's bright enough well, to see point, so that you can see it on the that's, viewfinder. That's always going to be a JPEG. That's not a RAW file. Right, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. But the JPEGs are completely normalized. Totally. Like, none of this has anything to do with, with, a, with an output recording or anything. Florian? I was going to say the same thing. Oh, okay. The aim is to apply it to get a brighter JPEG. To get a brighter JPEG, yeah. But, but the RAW file is completely independent of JPEG. Right. Oh, someone else is piping in. Uh, Austin is saying, noise profiles in an imaging setup will also be distorted by the gamma curve. JPEG pixels might appear more or less noisy than the equivalent raw image just because certain intensities are amplified and others are diminished. Um, yes, that's true. That's true. And we'll actually talk about that in, when we talk about post-processing. We'll talk about the relationship of gamma to denoising. That's a good point. Uh, Solomon? Uh, so you decided not to put quantization error in the noise equation? Um, yes. I, following barely, fairly standard text, not to put quantization in the noise formula. Okay. Um, <coughs> although certainly if you did dithering, then it would be an interesting way to add them together. Okay. So we're going to switch gears now, and we're going to talk about... Optical image stabilization. So what are the causes of camera shake? How can you avoid it without having an image stabilization system? And a uh, useful abstraction of camera shake as a 2D convolution. And then we'll talk about stabilization systems. We'll talk about mechanical. We'll talk about electronic, although the electronic is only between images, not within a single exposure. And uh, we'll talk about optical. So optical is what is in uh, most cameras uh, for still photography, and we'll talk about several kinds, lens shift, sensor shift, and how much does it help. Okay, so the primary cause of camera shake is uh, neuromuscular tremor. And so we shake. We shake at about 10 um, cycles per second, roughly sinusoidal. Depends on a lot of factors. Uh, what part of the day do you think we shake the least. Morning. Is morning better? Is afternoon better? Is evening better? What do you think? Morning. morning. How about late morning? <laughs> as soon as you get up, you're a mess. <laughs> then you gradually stabilize. So late morning is, is the best. And evening is the worst. You're tired. Uh, depends on um, temperatures, stimulants. Uh, so there are secondary causes, of course. The, uh, the SLR mirror flipping will cause the camera to shake. And so you can lock up the mirror on these things um, if you want uh, to avoid that. Of course, you lose your viewfinder when you do that, but there's live view that could take over. Um, you should have a tripod if you're taking very long shots. Uh, but the wind can also be a source of vibration. You have to be careful about that. It isn't just the neuromuscular tremor. Lots of exacerbating factors. If you have a long focal length lens, then you've got a heavy camera. Um, if you've got a very light camera, that's also a problem, actually. So these don't have very much mass, and the mass helps to stabilize the shot. Um, poor grip, poking at the shutter. So we've actually done measurements of our group of, in our group of for how many milliseconds is this thing shaking when you poke on the software shutter button. And it's measurable. And you have to be careful not to be capturing frames during that time. You should either capture them before or after. OK. Um, so everyone has seen camera shake. I hardly need to show any examples of it. But this is kind of an interesting image. Look at the way all the city lights kind of look the same. So that suggests this abstraction which is camera shake as convolution. So the way to think about it is uh, the camera shake is um, going to be a translation and a rotation. So each of those is three degrees of freedom. Uh, but for sufficiently distant objects, the translation is not going to change the image very much. The rotation that I do here will change the image a lot more. Um, so for sufficiently distant objects, we can ignore the camera translation. 
And then the camera roll is seldom a problem, although uh, some researchers argue otherwise. Um, and then if you assume that the, the two remaining degrees of freedom, which are pitching and yawing, are around the center of perspective, which is an assumption that could be around another point, um, but that's not too far from the center of gravity, probably, of the camera system, and so it might actually be true, then you can approximate them as 2D translations of the scene. So let's look at that geometrically. So here it, it is as rotations. So there's the center of projection on the left, and there's the sensor on the right. And if the sensor rotates with respect to the center of projection, then features will move up. Okay. We can approximate that as for sufficiently distant objects as a translation. Like that. The effect is nearly the same. The feature is moving up on the sensor. So rotating the sensor down relative to the center of projection is almost the same as just translating it up. And so if we can model it just as a, a movement of the sensor, that begins to suggest the spatial convolution. And so indeed, uh, you can imagine the scene f of x, y, and some filter function g of x, y, which is equal to the translation path, which is a function of the camera shake, and just convolve the two. Uh, so this, uh, this musical note here is actually uh, not simulated. This is a real photograph that I took in Tokyo. Um, I won't tell you what I was drinking, uh, but that's actually the picture I took. It just happened to make a camera shake that looked like a musical note. <laughs> really? I swear it's a real picture. Um, karaoke. <laughs> karaoke. Uh, okay, so you can, it, it looks like convolution. There's a bunch of point light sorts, each of which has been replaced by a s amplitude scaled copy of the filter function, the way I described convolution. Okay, so avoiding camera shake. Um, and so there's this great website on that. Let me, um, this is the dust pump lens, and let me actually stiffen it up a bit so it doesn't keep uh, sliding out. So what is she doing there? Elbows in, okay? Try and brace myself on my chest. Uh, exhale first. I usually inhale, but they say that exhaling is better. You'll shake less before the shot. Uh, all right. Um, cradle the camera. So I'm going to hold the lens at the same time, so I'm holding it in two places. That helps a lot. I can make that much more steady that way. Um, create a tripod. So get down like this and put my elbow on my knee, hold the other one in close, and that will stabilize it even more. Okay. So fairly simple ways to hold the camera that will improve things. Um, trigger the shutter slowly. Don't poke at the shutter. As you increase the focal length, reduce the exposure time. So let's look at the geometry of that. Uh, go back to Kings Lake's drawing. And if we look at the fields of view uh, for a short focal length at top and a longer focal length at bottom, and then we imagine that the camera shake is a certain number of degrees of shaking that is independent of the focal length itself, then it's going to be some fraction of the total field of view. So that will tell you how big that musical note's going to be. So as you increase the focal length for a fixed f sensor size, the camera shake becomes a larger fraction of the angular FOV. And so there's a rule of thumb as to how bad camera shake is going to be. To reduce it, you um, want a shorter exposure time so that it has shaken less during that exposure time. And the rule of thumb, which I already gave you once, is one over the focal length. So uh, if you take a shorter exposure, you have to compensate for it. So you could open the aperture, you could raise the ISO, uh, or you could use a flash. All right, let's consider some other factors. What happens if we were to keep the shorter focal length, so keep it a wide angle lens and just crop it in? to make it seem like a wide-angle lens. Will that help? So instead of using a longer focal length, instead of zooming this camera, we'll instead keep it wide-angle and then crop the image in. 
And it's worth thinking through all these things. As a photographer, you ought to know all these things. No, it really won't help because if you look at the situation, if I take the wide angle at the top and I just crop it, then I've got the same ratio of the camera shake degrees to the field of view. It's exactly the same situation as if I had gone to the longer focal length. So it doesn't help at all. Okay. Um, how does sensor size affect camera shake? Is it worse for the smaller sensors or better or no different at all? So it depends on the time, whether or not you're up in the night, depending on body style. Yeah, okay. Um, no, uh, let's assume we're not staying on the same body style. So we're comparing a single lens reflex camera to a point and shoot to a cell phone. So he's on the right track. If this is another one of these things where, well, this changes, we're probably changing this at the same time, and we have to work through all the factors. So let's do that. Uh, as the sensor shrinks, you typically decrease the focal length in order to maintain the same angular field of view. So going from the single lens reflex camera to the cell phone, this will have a shorter focal length. Um, okay, so since handshake is a constant angular arc, it remains a constant fraction of the field of view. So nothing changed there. As the sensor shrinks, the total number of megapixels t uh, typically stays constant, and the pixels get smaller. Um, but the sensor distance is smaller, so the pixels are smaller. So the number of pixels covered by the handshake, again, stays constant. So the blur size in, in number of pixels the is, is the same. So that hasn't changed. So under these assumptions, actually changing the sensor size, meaning going to a different format camera, doesn't change anything. Uh, and by the way, for smaller sensors, for smaller formats, you should use the 35 millimeter equivalent size when you're computing the rule of thumb. So if this were an APS-C camera and it were um, uh, 384 millimeters, I should enlarge it to 500 millimeters and use a 1 512th of a second exposure. Yes? This doesn't the damp yeah, the fact that the mass is different, no, it doesn't account for that. Okay, so there is one thing you can do, and that's walk. So if uh, in the case of the wide-angle lens where I'm getting the whole tree, but I didn't want the whole tree, I just wanted part of the tree, I can walk. So if I walk, now the field of view, I'm only seeing part of the tree here. I'm seeing the same part as I see here, but my sh camera shake is a smaller fraction of the angular field of view. So that does help. Of course, that changes the perspective and the occlusions. It's a different view that I'm seeing. But that does help. So that's a, a way to reduce camera shake. Of course, you can't always do that. You might fall off a cliff or something. All right, so keep the focal length constant and move toward the object. Lock up the mirror, get a better tripod, drink less coffee. Okay. All right, so um, any questions so far? We haven't talked about stabilization methods. We just talked about characterizing uh, camera shake. See if Dory says anything. Nope, nothing new. There's another suggestion. That yeah? Can you get in is that, you know, to, uh, you know, put it on like a, what do you call that, where you, you hold the photo down and take a bunch of pictures? Yeah. Take a bunch of pictures. Burst mode. Burst mode. So hold it down. Right. You know, I will talk. One, or you can use the third one. I will talk about uh, burst mode and uh, combining them uh, shortly. But even outside of combining them, the theory, I guess, is that the first one is somehow affected by the other. You, you can be luckier as well. I will talk about that as well shortly. Yes. There'll be a point where the motion. Yep, yep, yep. Out. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Okay. So, image stabilization systems. Uh, mechanical, electronic, which is among multiple shots, um, and optical uh, image stabilization. And so among multiple shots, of course, you can do it in the camera. Some cameras have a mode that does that. Or you can do it using uh, external software. Um, typically, this is cropping in slightly and then moving that crop window around over frames. So for video, this is, of course, important. That's between frames. Um, as well as the idea of aligning and combining a burst. And then eventually we'll get to talk about the optical stabilization, which is what is true in most <coughs> uh, photography cameras. Okay, so if you're a pro, you can carry around one of these that's a, 
uh, strapped around him. And it's got a big mass at the bottom, and it is a professional stabilization system. When you see these kinds of movies, that's how they're done. Guys walking around with one of those. This is just from the Steadicam's uh, website. And so he, in this case, he's walking backwards. So, uh, couldn't resist putting this in. I'll show you. Watch his head stay totally stationary <laughs> as I move his body. I can move his body in pretty much any direction, and his head stays rock solid in one position. This is really hard to do. So anyway, he knows exactly where his body is and where his body's moving. Cheetah. <clears throat> Country accent, of course, makes this. It's kind of fun to watch, isn't it? <laughs> actually, it's, uh, this is an amazing video because later on he'll, uh, um, he'll actually strap a camera to the chicken's head. This is actually pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, okay, so you can build a poor man's version of this yourself. Uh, there's just a point-and-shoot camera, and he's going to walk using that. But it's got a fairly heavy weight on the bottom, and you can see it looks stable. It's just capturing video using a point-and-shoot camera attached to this rig. And you can, you look online, there are lots of these poor man steady cams and ways to do that. You can even uh, buy them for cell phones. Uh, they don't work as well for a cell phone, but you can, you can buy them. There's a steady cam brand. Steady cam is a brand, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so electronic stabilization. So I've already talked about the electronic stabilization. Um, this is uh, my app again. This is the Lincoln Memorial, the second inaugural address. This is blurry due, due to a long exposure time. It's also noisy. Uh, and so I'm looking for lucky shots, actually. And I'll talk about lucky imaging a little bit later. And then I'm averaging them together to reduce the noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, so um, for video, let's talk about stabilization a little bit. So here is an iPhone just walking uh, around on the Stanford campus. So if you use the gyro and figure out what the rotation was, crop in a little bit and um, compensate for it, you can actually reduce that quite a bit. Now what you're not removing, you're compensating for this. You're not compensating for this. And so you can kind of see that rhythm as he's walking. So it's not compensating for the translation. So by doing this, he's effectively compensating for this convolution. Uh, so that's called uh, 2D stabilization. Uh, in order to compensate for the translation, that's much harder. That means w if I translate the phone, then what blocks what long viewing rays is actually changing. The occlusions are changing. And so I would have to figure out how far away things are, how far to shift each object, which depends on its depth, and then I'd have to infill a little bit with some texture or some local color or something. So 3D stabilization is much harder than 2D stabilization. But it is possible to do it. So here I am walking backwards along a hiking trail. Um, I'm not deliberately shaking the camera. I'm trying not to kill myself as I walk backwards. And I sent it to Asim Agrawala, who's now at Google, and said, here, stabilize this. And he sent this back. Isn't that amazing? Looks like it was captured on a rail. So he is actually computing a depth and moving objects according to their depth and then infilling a bit in the background. If I run that again, you look closely, you can see the, the background kind of warping a little bit as it tries to infill as it's moved the foreground hikers. Watch the grass kind of warping a little bit and then watch the horizon at the end. It'll go up and down a little bit. Right about there. Yeah. yeah, the horizon begins to do something funny as it tries to infill behind the hikers as it's, as it's moving the hikers around. It's very expensive. This cannot be done um, in real time, at least not on current day hardware. But it's aspirational <laughs> if one had programmable accelerators. Uh, okay, 
So let's get back to photography and talk about um, optical image stabilization. So you can do it by moving the lens or you can do it by moving the sensor. And different camera systems do one or the other. There are some of the names of their brands, uh, of their, their uh, branding of the stabilization. So lens shift stabilization means that if light's coming in like this, and I have rotated the camera accidentally, then instead of striking along the optical axis here, it'll strike a little bit too low. So that's the camera shake. It's doing this during a single exposure. But if I shift the lens, so this is one of these lens elements that's being translated laterally, um, that will cause that ray to po point back at the correct location again. So this has to be done really fast, as you can well imagine. It's got to detect that shake and move the lens instantly, effectively. Any delay at all will cause it not to come back to the, to the single correct point again. So it's an in-camera hardware system. Uh, there are typically two gyroscopes mounted on the lens, detecting the rotation of the lens. And then there are actuators that will translate a lens element or a group of lens elements. And they are um, electromagnets and spring-mounted, and you can sort of see what they do. It's a pretty amazing system that, that the thing works at all. Alternatively, you can shift the sensor. So you can still have um, two gyroscopes, again, that detect the rotation of the whole camera system. And then the sensor can be mounted with these piezoelectric elements that can move the sensor in two directions. And some camera systems even allow you to rotate them as well um, to try to compensate for more motions. The um, Sony a7 II uh, that I have has five axis uh, stabilization of the sensor. The only thing it doesn't do is it does, doesn't roll the sensor. Figures you can fix that in post. Uh, although, sorry, not for a single frame because it's blurred out within a single frame. So which of these two is better, the lens stabilization or the sensor stabilization? So they're interesting trade-offs. The lens shift gives you a stable viewfinder because remember the image is coming through, going through the stabilization and then going up to this diffuse screen which you then look at. So that means as I look through the viewfinder here on a lens like this one that is stabilized, I'll get a more stable viewfinder as soon as I have to engage the lens stabilization system. And especially for telephoto lenses, it's very useful to have a stabilized viewfinder. Stabilized viewfinder also means that the autofocusing and the metering, which both look at that same image, will work better. Um, and you can also optimize it for each lens. At least that's what the manufacturers claim that that's important. The sensor shift will work for every lens without having special mechanisms in the lens. So on my Sony A7 system, I can put uh, a manual Leica lens on it, and it will stabilize that lens because it's doing the stabilization in the sensor. Um, it stabilizes the autofocus and the metering for that kind of camera because it's a mirrorless camera. It's looking at the sensor. And as long as the sensor is doing this, then the image on the sensor will be stable, and then that helps for metering and focusing. So on the mirrorless cameras, there's no particular advantage in doing that beforehand. Um, and reduces the size and weight of lenses. Again, <laughs> they'll claim better optical performance. It's hard to uh, work out what those are. So Canon is um, lens stabilized, but some of these mirrorless, uh, these mirrorless systems are going to sensor stabilization because they, that also stabilizes the autofocusing and the metering. Uh, okay, so some examples. You've all seen probably stabilized lenses. It's interesting to look to look at it kind of semi-quantitatively as uh, um, as uh, this guy does. So this is um, Ken Rockwell. So what he says is, without uh, vibration reduction or image stabilization, um, you are unlikely to get a sharp image at an eighth of a second. You're very likely at a two hundred and fiftieth of a second. And at a 30th of a second, about half of your images will be sharp. So one way to look at this. So remember I said that um, the uh, musculo 
the neuromuscular tremor is sinusoidal. So if it is sinusoidal, then let's say it's a um, tenth of a second exposure. So that's a fairly long exposure. Um, so each third of this would be a sixtieth of a second. If it were the first sixtieth of a second, then this is 0 0.86, where this is 1 at the top. So that's a lot of shake. But if I happen to be lucky um, that my 60th of a second exposure is this one, then the total amount of shake is just this much, which is 0 0.14. So if I'm taking a 60th of a second exposure, uh, sorry, I did this wrong. The, neuro, the neuromuscular tremor is 10 cycles per second. So this is a tenth of a second. I'm taking a sixtieth of a second exposure. Therefore, I'm taking an exposure this long relative to the tremor. If it happens to be this first section, then I get a lot of shake. If it happens to be the second one, it's that much shake just due to the sine of 60 degrees versus the sine of 90 degrees. Um, so there's a huge difference. So you really can be lucky. And so you should always take lots of shots. And so he's figuring out roughly when are about half of the lucky. And without stabilization, he says at a, um, that half of them are lucky uh, somewhere between a 30th and a 60th of a second. Um, depends how much coffee you've had. With, with stabilization or uh, vibration reduction, you might get half of them sharp at about a quarter of a second. I have not seen exactly this much. It really depends on the stabilization system. Usually I see more like two or three stops, not three or four stops. But presumably the hardware continues to get better. Um, so that is a, a way to sort of semi-quantitatively think about the effect of uh, stabilization. So this idea that you're sometimes lucky and sometimes not is, of course, used in astronomy. So if you have an a, um, amateur telescope and you look at the surface of the moon, you might see something like this because of atmospheric turbulence. These cells of uh, denser or rarefied air are roughly 20 to 40 centimeters. And so they'll cover your aperture, but they'll come and go quickly. Um, but what you can do is take little, you can either try to be lucky altogether, or you can take little patches when you are lucky and put them together and make a single image like this. So it's possible to really improve things that way by cutting the image into small parts and looking for a lucky image of each part of the field of view. So another thing you can do is you could try to invert the blur. You can try to deconvolve. Um, so basically you say there's an unknown scene. I see a blurry version of it. I'm modeling this as a convolution. Let's try to invert that matrix multiplication, which, is, which represents the convolution. The problem is that this inversion um, typically enhances noise. And so you don't see cameras doing that. Uh, and here's just how much that noise gets enhanced. This is some work that I did with a graduate student at Stanford where we said, well, suppose I take a burst. And for that burst, it's a single static scene. I have multiple differently convolved blurred, differently blurred observations of it. And so if I know what that blur function is because I have a calibrated gyroscope, then maybe I can do a better job of inverting it. And the answer is yes. The more observations you have, the more you can do. It really depends on a very good calibrated gyro. And on our cell phones, they're not even timestamp synchronized uh, in past devices at any rate. Um, but it is possible to do this and it will reduce the noise enhancement. So it's an interesting possibility for the future. Another thing you can do, of course, for object blur is just pan. Now that's not for handshake blur, that's for object blur. This takes quite a bit of practice, by the way. I took a lot of shots before I got that one to look reasonable. Um, OK, camera shake, uh, moving a lens, um, optical stabilization allows somewhere two, three, four stops. Take lots of sh shots and hope you're lucky. So anything more on 
stabilization, because that's all I'm going to say about stabilization. Let's see if the Dory has anything. Questions? Planning phase. Uh, most of the stabilization systems now will try to help you planning, right? So you by, by only stabilization, stabilizing the dimension other than the one you're planning on. So um, the, the question is, um, will the stabilization st systems help you when you're panning? Yeah, there are several stabilization modes on this. There's one in particular for axial motion, meaning s something moving at me. Mm -hmm. And it will try to, um, well, it's, you know, sorry, that's for focus. Um, for, a for a horizontal motion? Horizontal okay. Panning, yeah. And uh, what's more, you have to be very careful to turn off these stabilization systems when you put it on tripod. Otherwise, it'll compensate for things that aren't there. So. According to uh, Canon, that's actually a myth. That's actually a myth? Yeah. Uh, that you don't have, so you don't have to turn off the stabilization right. system when it's on tripod? Right. Ah, OK. Oh, maybe that's a change also. Maybe it used to be true and is no longer true. Yeah. Interesting. Definitely not true with that one. Not true with this? You don't have to turn it off? No, you have to turn it off. You have to turn it off. Yeah. This is the 100 to 400 dust pump. Uh -huh. OK. I have found it to be true on this one, but I didn't have anything authoritative to say. We'll, we'll take Florian as authoritative. OK. Canon also claims that mirror lockup is not necessary. So the uh, so Canon claims that mirror lockup is not necessary? OK. Long running argument. Long running argument. All right. OK. So I've got a little bit more time. Uh, let me try first to finish up the autofocus lecture by talking just briefly about active autofocus. It's not something that is important for most cameras, um, but it's worth just mentioning. I've mentioned a few aspects of this um, briefly. So there used to be active autofocus systems. Uh, the Polaroid had a sonar, um, which has a limited range and is stopped by glass, so it's actually not a great focusing system, but people have repurposed it for robotics. You can do time of flight, and so um, this uh, Nexus 6P has a time of flight sensor, an infrared time of flight sensor. It's stopped by glass as well, so you need to check your result when you're done. Uh, and uh, quite a bit of tuning went into that in the case of the Nexus 6P. Um, it requires very fast circuitry because light travels so fast and doesn't work in very bright scenes. You can also do uh, range finding, so you can do triangulation. And so this is from a, a great book called The Dark Side of the Lens by uh, Goldberg. And it's a little bit hard to see what he's saying here, but he's saying that there's a, uh, a light going out into the world, makes a spot on the object, and depending on whether uh, that spot comes back and strikes one of these three cells that it will have been a near object, a medium object, or a distant object. So it's the same triangulation geometry that I showed for the Leica rangefinder camera, except that it's being done actively by a pulse uh, send out and you look at where that spot is when it comes back. And so knowing the baseline, you can figure it out. So um, this idea of triangulation uh, range finding can be used um, when you have two views and you want, uh, so this is the depth from stereo, which we talked about when we talked about phase-based focusing. In the case of the Connect 1, it's sending out uh, just a texture from this IR video projector, putting that texture on all objects, and then using stereo from two cameras in order to triangulate, assuming that that texture gives you something to, uh, it gives you features to match on. The Connect 2 operates differently than this. It has a time of flight sensor. But in this case of the Connect 1, it, you can get a rough depth map that way, and you can play video games. Uh, complete tangent here, this idea of triangulation range finding can also be used for getting accurate 3D models. So uh, if you have a laser that is spread by a cylindrical lens into a sheet, it makes a line on the object. And if you look at it from the side um, with a known baseline, that distance on the sensor can be converted into that distance. And so this is the basis for laser range find, uh, for laser triangulation range finders used by highway surveyors, but also used to come up with very accurate 3D models for objects. So 
we use that during the digital Michelangelo project. We took one of these li laser triangulation rangefinders to Italy, and there's the stripe running up the David. A um, bunch of people doing a bunch of all-nighters to scan the statue. There I am when I had hair of a different color with uh, a bunch of Stanford students. And there's the model that we captured. So we're zooming into a model. This is not a photograph of the statue. And to give you a sense of the scale of the geometry you can capture using laser triangulation range finding, there's his eye. And there's the mesh showing the triangles. So it's quarter millimeter precision over the entire statue. It's a billion polygon model, <coughs> um, which we use for a variety of things. There's an, there was for a while an interactive kiosk. We made copies of the statue. I was going to bring in one of the copies today, but it's developed some hairline cracks in it. And I'm preserving it for the Computer History Museum, so you can go visit it there in a, in a year. We'll, we'll fix it and we'll s give it to the Computer History Museum. Um, so it's a rapid prototyping process. It was done by, by giant, Gentle Giant Studios in Los Angeles. They don't talk about their process, but I imagine they use some sintering SL or SLA method, made a positive master, a latex negative mold, and then these plastic copies. Um, it's not that long ago. It's, oh, it's okay. um, comparable to modern technology for making copies, except that in this case, uh, we wanted to be able to make a lot of copies, so they only made one master using rapid prototyping technologies. The 3D model was used for a lot of scientific studies as well. For example, a finite element structural analysis to decide whether when the David leaned forward slightly in the 19th century in his perch in the Piazza Signoria outdoors, whether the, uh, that was sufficient stress on his ankles to cause the cracks that they now observe. And so the finite element uh, analysis said, based on our 3D model, said yes. That is enough to explain the cracks. They, it's not a recent crack. They don't have to worry about it now that he's upright in the gallery at that academia. Probably the biggest use of these uh, laser triangulation scanning methods now is in the entertainment business. Uh, so this is a fun magazine to look at, by the way, Cinefx. Well, I'll tell you how all the special effects are done for recent Hollywood movies. So Davy Jones is entirely computer graphics. Uh, there's not a person in a mask there. And so they have a computer graphics model. And then uh, they'll start with a clay model. They'll digitize the clay model using a laser triangulation rangefinder to produce a computer model. Then they'll uh, actually have an actor, uh, William Nighy, who uh, they'll put dots on and do motion capture of him for the motion of the statue. Uh, f sorry, for the motion of the um, uh, 3D model. But the shape of the 3D model was a clay maquette that was scanned using laser triangulation rangefinder. And then rendered. So it's fully a rendering. The more gratuitous animation. So oh, that's completely computer graphic, based on a laser scan. Um, any questions on that? I have one more thing to, to show you today. Okay. I know it was sort of a tangent. All right, so in this point in my Stanford course, what I would usually do is have a lecture where Mark Horowitz, uh, my colleague at Stanford, joins me and we take apart a camera down to the last screw, which is a lot of fun. And we've got a magnified projector so I've had to, uh, for time constraints, I've had to cut that out of this course. But there's a great project that some Berkeley students did where they did a 3D modeling of a Canon camera down to the last screw and show how it's put together. Let me show you that video, and I'll narrate over it a little bit because it'll show a lot of the subsystems that we've been considering. And let's hope this runs. So this is an older Canon camera, but most of the mechanical parts have not changed. <coughs> Starts off a little bit slow. So this is, this is a, a project that these students did in a mechanical engineering class. And I don't know how many all-nighters they pulled for this. this is
you know, I'm sure they got an A++ part for this project. This is an A++ I think it's just like three students. So they, see the two mirrors? One was the um, uh, the viewfinder mirror and the other one was the autofocus mirror. I showed you those before. So there's the shutter assembly for the focal plane shutter. Remember it has to be able to do this really fast or make a slit of a certain size. Remove that slit. I think this is the viewfinder assembly, which is giving you relaxed focusing, and fo focusing at infinity of the focusing screen, the diffuse screen that's inside the camera. It's been a little bit too long on the mechanical assembly, but these are mechanical engineering students, so they're allowed. What's amazing is that they didn't have any drawings. They digitized these things themselves. This is modeled ab initio. It's completely amazing. So there's the sensor. And the uh, viewfinder, the electronic viewfinder. Gets interesting again when they they'll put a lens on it in a minute. The lens. Although, if you think about these cameras, I'm sure a lot of very careful design and iteration has gone into these mechanical parts because these cameras are very robust. Florian is fond of showing me how he's taken his 1D camera, Canon 1D, out into adverse conditions, which includes the surf, saltwater spray. That's fine. He just hoses it off, showers it off when he gets back. And it's completely amazing that they can take that much of a beating. So the mechanical design is really pretty 
we're almost done with the body. We'll start the lens in just a moment. What is that? It looks like a 15, is that a 15 millimeter, 15.8? I forgot whether it's a zoom lens. Zoom lens. Oh, I think it is actually a zoom lens. So if you look really carefully, you'll see the autofocus, you'll see the ultrasonic focusing mirror. This little snake thing go by really fast. Look at the slots that the lenses move along. So that gives the curves of motion. I think it is a zoom lens. So it's going it to, zo both zooms and focuses using those complicated slots. The, the two lenses move at different rates, so you can see the different angles of those slots. All right, so the ultrasonic motor is right there, that tooth thing, I think. I think the lights will sh sh they'll show it animate a little bit. There it is. See, now it's focused. That little thing is making snaky sinusoids. I show this video to my Stanford students partially to shame them. It was done by Cal students. Well, quite a bit of electronics in these lenses as well. I guess this is probably a stabilized lens. I didn't notice the stabilization. Not stabilized? Oh, thank you. 24 to 85. Okay, cool. So there's a zoom. You can see the field of view. Diaphragm? Sorry? <laughs> do they work for Pixar or do they? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I've never, I've never followed up with these students. I should. All right, so a mirror flips up and the focal plane shutter opens and then closes again. So this is an exposure that's long enough that it didn't need to make a slit. Oh, did the flash go off? Right. So the exposure opened long enough so that the flash could go off. We'll talk about that later when we talk about flash illumination. So these are the guys I should follow up with. Uh, it's very impressive achievement. For a course. Okay. So... Um, So that's it for today. Uh, so again, there'll be a lecture Monday, um, and then none on Wednesday, and then the following week will be a full normal week, and we'll do color that following week. Okay? See you on Monday.